Hey guys, how you doing? It's Coach Scott, and I uh, just want to uh, uh, take a minute and go ahead and start our next video. Let's think about what we've done, right? We've already talked about the, uh, the, the origin of the atom and how we came about with our current model of the atom. We've talked about the subatomic particles and the discovery of those. Now let's get into um, a really cool little section uh, where we're going to start, start talking about radioactivity which was, you know, as they discovered, they were working with radioactivity when they discovered the subatomic particles. Let's see how those things go. All right, so, um, yeah. So, if you remember, after the Big Bang, um, hydrogen and helium were created, and hydrogen, of course, is the lightest type of atom, was the first to form. Now, what do we know about hydrogen? Most of the isotopes contain one proton and one electron. Now, if you look at that, uh, the nuclear symbol here, right, hydrogen one, that means it has a mass, an atomic mass of one, right? Uh, the one down below means that it has one proton. So what does that tell us? That it's got one proton and an electron. That's it. So... Recall we were dealing with isotopes. Protons and neutrons, they continued to collide and they were held together by what we call the strong nuclear force. The strong force. And these created more of a massive version of hydrogen, a different version. And we call them deuterium. And then, of course, uh, uh, two deuterium atoms would fuse together and would form helium, helium-3, and there'd also be trace amounts of what we call tritium, hydrogen with two neutrons, and lithium, okay, uh, atomic number three, all right, element number three. So, when these two deuteriums would fuse together to form the helium, the mass of the helium, helium atom is less than that of the two original atoms. So, there's a missing mass. And we call that delta M or the change in mass, right? Or the mass defect. Now, Einstein, this is where he became sort of famous for. Um, he found, hypothesized, that this mass, this missing mass, is converted to energy and uh, this is where he comes with the E equal MC squared. But that EB, or the binding energy, is equal to the change of mass, the mass defect, times the square of the speed of light. Now we call this EB the binding energy, or what holds those positive charge protons together. Think about it. Do, do like charges attract? No. They, they don't like each other. So there's another amount of energy, the great force, that holds the nucleus intact. So, the energy of fusion powers the stars that we see at night. It powers our sun that keeps us warm, provides us food and energy. Now, it works to make increasingly heavy atoms as they fuse together. And the source of most atoms, heavier than hydrogen and helium, up to iron. Now recall from our first lecture, elements he heavier than iron are formed when stars explode in massive supernova explosions. Now, these heavier nuclei also release energy, okay, when they divide through fusion and they come overcome the binding energy. So energy is released whenever a nucleus gets closer to being iron, the most stable nucleus. Fusion holds a great promise as being virtually unlimited form of energy for use here on Earth. So far, though, people have, we've only been able to unleash this energy in an explosive form that we know as the hydrogen bomb. So we're continuing to, continuing to search for the peaceful use of fusion energy. So while nuclear fusion re reactions 
They will release energy while generating massive elements. Nuclear fission releases energy when it divides very massive elements. So, the heavy nucleus will split into two lighter nuclei. Okay, and when the nucleus, the heavier nucleus, any, any nucleus heavier than iron will divide into parts. The mass of the resulting nuclei is less than the, the original. That's where the power of fission comes from. All right, this is the binding energy that is released. Uranium is a very heavy element which releases energy when it divides into lighter elements. So the heaviest heavy nucleus splits into two nuclei of smaller mass. So this is the general equation that we use to describe the fission of uranium-235. So in this one, we start with uranium-235. All right, Oops. We start with uranium-235, right? Uh, and that, of course, is the atomic mass of that particular atom. And uranium, of course, is element number 92. So one neutron will bombard itself into that nucleus, and it will form an intermediate state of uranium-236. So... Uranium-236 will then break apart, because it's not very stable, into two other elements where the masses are conserved, along with some neutrons and this binding energy, right? And, of course, our protons are conserved, and that means they stay the same uh, with these other elements. So, let's look at some questions. And this is one that I will help you with first, okay? So, um, let me pin out. So, I've got uranium-235. It gets bombarded with a neutron, and it forms an intermediate uranium-236. So, in this collision, barium-141 and three neutrons are formed, plus energy, the binding energy. So, how do we figure this one out? Well, I know that protons are conserved, so if I subtract 56 from 92, I get 36. 36. All right, so if I look on my chart, on my periodic table, I see that element number 36 is krypton. All right, so krypton gave me the answer, but let's see uh, what the atomic mass of that krypton is atom will be. So I started with 236, whoops, 236 um, neutrons, all right, and I subtract 141 from there, plus three additional neutrons are released, so I subtract three from there, and I come up with krypton 92, okay, so the correct answer you'll see is, of course, krypton, but how did I get it? Okay. I subtracted 141 from 236. I subtracted 3 from that number, and I come up with 92 neutrons. How did I know that it was krypton? I subtracted 56 from 92. So those two elements are formed on that fusion process, fission process. All right, so let's, I'll give you a chance to work this one. So in this one, all right, in this fusion process of uranium, Uranium-235 is bombarded with a, um, with a neutron. Of course, it's going to have an intermediate state of uranium-236. But then what other element is formed? Um, take a minute, break the uh, video, and see what you come up with. Okay, you should come up with strontium. Strontium is element number 38. Because if I take 92 minus 58, excuse me, 52, I come up with element number 40, zirconium, excuse me. Yeah, so that should be zirconium. 
92 minus 52. Oh, excuse me, 92 minus 52. I cannot run this calculator to die. 52, I come up with element number 40. Element number 40 is, of course, zirconium. There's a misspelling in that. We'll have to correct it. So that should be Z, Z, R. All right. 92 minus 52 equals 40, which is ZR, zirconium. All right. And then let's get the uh, mass number right. So 236 minus 137 minus two neutrons, two, I come up with 97. So that is zirconium 97. And you can see, looking at your periodic chart, that is a radioactive isotope, not the kind you would find in a ring. So the energy release in this fusion reaction is very, very, very large. The smaller nuclei are stable with fewer neutrons. These nuclei don't like to be fat, okay? So whenever they break apart, multiple neutrons will emerge from each fission reaction. And these neutrons can then be used to induce fission in surrounding nuclei. Then we get what we call a chain reaction. So in 1942 at the University of Chicago, Enrico Fermi, Okay, built the first self-sustaining nuclear reaction. Now, we'll look at this in class, or you can look at it yourself at home. Go to fet.colorado.edu. Uh, yeah, just go to that link, and then you can see what, the, what a chain reaction looks like. So, what do we use mm -hmm. nuclear fission for? Uh, nuclear fission was used to create the uncontrolled release of energy. We know it as the atomic bomb. Uh, it was used in Nagasaki and Hiroshima uh, to end World War II. And then now we're using the release of this energy uh, with fusion. And we use it in a peaceful use uh, in nuclear power plants to produce electricity. So uranium or plutonium is the fuel that will power these nuclear power plants. We also use it in ships and submarines uh, to power our ships. And other than waste products, it's a very efficient form of, well, making electricity. So this is what a nuclear power plant looks like. Okay, if you see this, you have the reactor right there. Those are control rods, which will be inserted to chill the reaction a little bit. Then you have a substance, an oil, a water, that will go through the reactor, will heat up, right, and create steam, all right? Okay, and this steam um, will then go through the other side, right, and this steam will turn a electrical turbine, producing the electricity, and then it will condense the steam and go back around Right, and it's just a continuous process producing electricity. You have to keep it cool because it's a very, very hot process. So fission occurs when the vessel, the red vessel, okay, will heat the water in the primary loop, and this will boil water in the secondary loop. All right, and once you get to this part right here, essentially you're doing the same thing as in a coal-fired plant, right? You're producing heat to uh, produce steam to, burn, to turn a, a, an electrical generator, right? A turbine, if you would. Okay. Well, um, guys, this is Coach Scott. There's our first little video on nuclear fusion and fission and radioactivity. And uh, we'll talk some more about it in the future. Okay. Well, this is Coach Scott saying, hey, guys, have a great day. Bye for now.